This lesson is for section 1.1 and 1.2 on properties of real numbers. Our objectives for today are to classify real numbers and also to use their properties to evaluate expressions. That's something that we're going to work on on the back side of your notes. So in today's lesson, we're going to be classifying real numbers and going through a lot of vocabulary terms. The first term we need to make sure you understand is what a real number actually is. So a real number is any number that can be expressed in decimal form. It's any number that you find on a number line. Now, um, you're probably thinking, well, aren't all numbers found on a number line? But actually, not all numbers are on a number line. We have numbers called complex and imaginary numbers that would not be found on a real number line, OK? So I actually couldn't pick which diagram I like better, so I just put both of them in here um, to help you kind of visualize how we classify real numbers, OK? So um, really what we're looking at to the right on this Venn diagram is this portion of this diagram here, all right? As you can see, real numbers here are uh, broken down into irrational or rational numbers. So we've got irrationals here and rational numbers, OK? Now within the set of rational numbers, You've got integers, whole numbers, and natural numbers. So integers, whole numbers, and natural numbers. So just like a Venn diagram works, um, natural numbers are also considered whole numbers. But not every whole number is a natural number, OK? So um, just to kind of help you go through, uh, or to help visualize, I want you to refer back to this diagram as we go through the vocabulary terms. So we're actually going to take you through and help you understand what these different types of numbers actually are. So first up, we've got imaginary numbers. Um, like I said, these are numbers that are not real numbers. You can't find these on a number line. Okay, This is a non-real number um, that we'll actually use during second semester once we start solving quadratic equations with non-real solutions. So this is something that you guys are yet to see, but um, I'll just give you an example. We actually denote an imaginary number with an i. So 3i is an example of an imaginary number, Okay, or even negative 3i. Now, a counting number is also referred to as a natural number. This is the more common way to refer to a, a number as a natural number, but I think it's easier to understand as a counting number. So way back in the day, you know, at the advent of numbers, the number system, um, when they started counting, they started with the number one. Think about little kids. When they start counting, they don't say zero first. They say one, two, three, and sometimes they don't know the rest of the numbers, but they always start with one. So way back, you know, when, when, uh, before when the cavemen were running around they counted starting with one so the set of natural numbers is the set of all numbers okay beyond one and above okay so these are your your uh, the set of your natural numbers now digits you know if somebody says give me your digits um, these are only the counting numbers uh, including zero so from zero one two three four five, six, seven, eight, nine, you get the point. Okay, so it's just these, these are the digits, zero through nine, okay? So the way I'm writing this um, grouping of numbers, you can see here, I'm ending this with uh, this little bracket. These are the only numbers that would be considered digits. Here, because I have this dot, 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 it's saying it's gonna continue on in that pattern forever, okay? So this is an infinite number of numbers that we would consider natural numbers, whereas here are the digits, there's only 10 of them, okay? All right, next up we have the whole numbers, okay? Now, for whole numbers, this is something that um, came about because we needed a way to describe having nothing, right? Um, you know, when a farmer wanted to describe that he, he didn't have any cows, he needed a number to be able to do that, so they invented zero. Um, so the whole numbers are all of your natural numbers, including zero, okay? Again, this goes on forever. So the reason why I remember that whole numbers has zero is because I think of literally a whole. And that reminds me of zero. All right, next up we have integers. Now, integers are all of the whole numbers, but also negative numbers. So numbers like negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, including 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay, so I like to think of this as at some point the farmers they needed a way to like say you owe me three cows. So that's how we came up with negative numbers in that system. Next up we have rational numbers. So the word ratio appears in rational, and that's how I remember what a rational number is. It's a number that can be expressed as a ratio of two integers. 
Okay, so any two numbers that can be written as a ratio. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots, I mean, an infinite number of examples here that I could give. Um, something like two thirds or negative two thirds. These are rational numbers. Even the number zero is a rational number because you can rewrite zero as a ratio of zero over one or zero over two or zero divided by three and so on. Okay, so anything that can be written as a ratio is considered um, a, an, a rational number. Okay. Now an irrational number, these are, these are numbers that are non-repeating and non-terminating decimals. Oh, I should refer back to rational real quickly. Let me give you another example. Something like 0.79, that is also a rational number because we can turn that into 79 one hundredths, right? Like everything can be written as a ratio, all, all these kind of decimals. However, when you end up with non-repeating and non-terminating decimals, in other words, they go on forever and forever without a pattern of 0.999999, okay? Um, then you end up with something called an irrational number. These are numbers like the square root of 2 or the square root of 5. These are values that continue forever. These are decimal values that continue forever and forever. Okay, They're non-repeating and non-terminating. So those are a couple examples right there. And finally, we have transcendental numbers. I just think this is a cool word. Um, it's also an irrational number. Okay. Um, but it's represented with a symbol. So the most famous transcendental number is pi. Another one that you're going to use next year in pre-calc is e. Um, we'll see this a little bit in our course as well, but we're not really going to talk about what the value of e is. We're just going to use it occasionally in this course. All right, there's one last thing. I want to come back up here and actually give you the abbreviations because when, when um, mathematicians refer to these different sets of numbers, they don't always write out natural numbers. They use an abbreviation so that everybody knows they're using a number within that number system. So natural numbers, we use this N. It's kind of like a fancy N. I'm not even very good at doing it. It's like kind of like that. Um, so it's just a capital N. Whole numbers, same thing. They kind of get fancy with them. They draw like this nice weird W. Um, integers. That one's kind of uh, a goofy one. They use a Z for integers. Okay. Rational numbers, a Q. And you might be wondering why they use a Q. It's for quotient, because the ra ratio. Um, and real numbers, we have uh, double bar R. Now, for irrational numbers, there is no symbol. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with some examples. We're going to classify each of these numbers, and many of them actually fit into more than just one number set, okay? Because if you go back to your diagram, see how a, a natural number is also a whole number, right? Which means that it's also an integer, which means it's rational, which means it's real. So we can go ahead and try to classify it in as many ways as we can. So negative two-thirds. Well, when I look at this, I know that I can definitely find it on a number line, which means it's a real number. So that's a start, okay? Now, if this number is a ratio, then obviously it can be written, um, or we can call that a rational number, right? Because it can be written as a ratio. So we're going to use Q for rational number. All right, now since this number is not an integer, that means it cannot possibly be a whole number or a natural number. So if it's not an integer, it doesn't work its way back down, okay? So it's not a whole number, it's not a natural number, so we're done with classifying negative two-thirds. Now the square root of 121, this one's on here, it can get, kind of be tricky for students. They think maybe sometimes it's irrational, but it's not. The square root of 121, that's actually equivalent to 11. Now when you look at 11, obviously you can find that on a number line, so that is definitely real. And you can also write that as a quotient, right? right? It's, it's a ratio. So we'll use rational numbers as well, because we can write that as 11 over 1. So we've got a, ra a real number, which is also a rational number, and it happens to be an integer, right? So let me slide back up here. So it happens to be an integer. Since it's 11, it would also qualify as a whole number and a natural number. So we're going to use all of those classifications. So we've got integer, whole number, and uh, counting number, a natural number. All right, now the next one, uh, 9.9999999 repeating. Sometimes students think that this means that it's irrational because it's non-terminating. Non-terminating means it doesn't end. However, it's repeating, right? It's constantly repeating nine, 99999. So this is actually a rational number. It is not irrational. We would say that this is a real number. It is a rational number because it can be written as a ratio, but it is not an integer which means it's not a whole number and it's not a natural number. 
Okay, I would like you guys to try your best to do four, five, and six on your own. Now remember, you're gonna get lots of practice with this tomorrow, so if these definitions are kind of overwhelming, that's okay, you're gonna be able to reference your notes the whole time, as well as those diagrams as you work through some practice problems. So go ahead and try four through six, and then check with the key, and you can move on to the back side of your notes. Okay, now listed here in this chart are all the number properties that um, you should be familiar with. Um, I know that you've already seen the commutative property and the associative property in previous classes, probably way back in like fourth and fifth grade, you were introduced to this. So um, it's definitely just here for your reference, but we want to talk about the identity and the inverse properties of addition and multiplication. So we say that zero is the identity element of addition because whenever you add zero to anything, um, you always get the same thing. So you get the identity, you get itself, okay? So it's called the identity element. Now, for multiplication, one would be considered the identity element because one times anything gives you itself, okay? So um, we, we just wanna refer to this because you will hear us say identity element of multiplication or addition. Now the inverse property of addition and the inverse property of multiplication are something that you are probably already familiar with, you just didn't know that that's what it was. When, For example, when you're solving an equation and um, you wanna get x alone here, you would have to subtract three, right? You're doing the inverse operation of adding three. You're taking negative three or subtracting three. So you do use inverse po properties all the time, you just don't realize it. So the inverse property, um, means that when you take something and you take its opposite, you will always get zero, the identity element of addition. So adding opposites gives you the identity element of addition. Remember, the identity element of addition was zero, okay? Now, um, when you multiply by the reciprocal, you end up getting the identity element of multiplication. So a times one over a, in, order, in other words, like seven times one seventh will always give you one. So a number and its reciprocal will always give you the identity element of multiplication, all right? And then finally, um, for the distributive property, I know that you've seen this plenty of times, um, but it only works when you are distributing over addition, okay? So you would distribute the a to both terms here, a times b and, a time, and um, add a times c, like so, but it doesn't work when you multiply um, you don't distribute when you're multiplying, okay? So a lot of students will, will get confused and they wanna distribute the C here as well. This is not true. A times BC is not equal to AB times AC. So we have an example here. Hopefully you can refer back to this every once in a while. If you were asked to simplify six times a half times four, you don't take six and multiply it by a half and then multiply it by four. That is not correct, okay? You would just multiply six times a half times four or one half times four and then multiply that quantity by six. All right, so let's move on now to the last portion of our lesson. Um, we're gonna be solving some equations, but as you can see in the directions, it's a little bit different than our normal directions. It says solve in the indicated domain. So let's go through the first example and kind of talk about what that really means. So we've got two X plus three is equal to X minus one. This is not a tricky problem, but uh, basically you just subtract X on both sides and then obviously subtract three, so we end up with x is equal to negative four. Now, it's asking us to solve within the indicated domain. Our first set of numbers that we wanna look for are real numbers. So if our answer here is a real number, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna put it in bracket notation, just like we did above when we were classifying numbers, and we're gonna put that number inside those brackets, okay? This is saying that our answer does fall within the domain of real numbers, okay? Now for part B, we want positive numbers only. Now this is clearly not a positive number, so instead what we can do is we have two different options. We can show the empty set, meaning we have two brackets here with nothing inside, or you can put a zero with a slash through to show no solution, okay? So there is no solution within the set of positive numbers to this particular equation. That's what it says when you wanna solve in the indicated domain. Now, the last one here is in the set of integers. Sorry, there's a bracket missing here. Um, so within the set of integers, is negative four an integer? Yes, it is an integer if you look back at your definitions here. So we're gonna place that negative four inside the bracket because it is part of the set of integers. All right, so let's take a look now at example two. So the idea here is you solve it completely normally. So that's what we're gonna do first. Let's just find our solutions. Let's square root both sides. So we have x is equal to Remember to have positive or negative square root eight. It's very common to leave off the positive negative. Um, and then make sure you also reduce the answer, 
Okay, so reduce that radical so you have positive or negative 2 root 2. Now you have to consider whether or not positive and negative 2 root 2 fit within the specified domains here. So we have the first one is the set of real numbers. Now because positive 2 root 2 and negative 2 root 2 are both found on the number line, we're going to include both of those numbers. Okay. Now for B, we want rational numbers. Now the fact that we have root 2 here, remember root 2 itself is an irrational number. And when we multiply that irrational number by 2, we still get another irrational number. So we're going to have the empty set here. Neither 2 root 2 or negative root 2 are rational numbers. So we have the empty set. So you can answer it like this, or you could answer it like that with no solution. All right, now part C here says only negative reals. Now, obviously, positive 2 root 2 will not work, but negative 2 root 2 will. Okay, so that would be um, our answer for number 2, A, B, and C. All right, the final question here, I'd like you guys to try on your own. Make sure you don't overcomplicate this problem when you try to solve it, because look, it's already set up to use the zero product property. So this should be a pretty quick one for you to try on your own. Um, go ahead and check your answers with the key, and then um, come to class ready to ask any questions that you might have. Great job. I will see you tomorrow.